All righty, three, two, and one, and we are rolling. This is Dr. Michael Muller with the Michael Muller Mentality. I'm sitting down with uh, Ryan Smith here today. I'm really glad to have him. He's the uh, physician advisor for TaylorMade Compounding. Uh, Ryan, thanks for jumping on the podcast with me. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dr. Muller. I'm excited to talk with you. All righty. So a few things we want to go over today, uh, just from a, from a, a doctor's perspective, I want to talk about the safety. Uh, peptides right now are kind of a little bit of the wild, wild west, people purchasing them, purchasing them online, and then they're not having anyone help them guide them. And then also just talking about the actual peptides. Um, so Ryan, I would, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about you and what you're doing at, at TaylorMade. Yeah, so uh, TaylorMade is a relatively new pharmacy. We've only been around for a little over three years now, but we really have specialized in peptide uh, pharmaceuticals and giving some additional options. We've been doing this in Australia for over 13 years. Uh, my journey with TaylorMade started at the very, very beginning, sort of helped start it. Um, I was uh, a medical school student who uh, passed step one and became a little disillusioned with the entire process. Um, and I had a background in uh, recombinant protein synthesis and peptide synthesis. Um, and I just happened to meet uh, people from Australia who were doing the same thing. So I was lucky enough to be uh, presented with the opportunity to do this uh, in a pharmaceutical realm, similar to the business model of Australia. Um, and we started to make compounding. Awesome. Was there anything that kind of got you into it? Like, did you use some of the peptides yourself or how did you get interested? Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, you know, um, as, you know, someone who, who enjoys, again, just uh, sort of working on performance and a lot of those things, these things were not new to me. I, you know, uh, People have been using, uh, you know, things like the Smoral and GHRB2s for ages, and I was definitely exposed to that. Um, but whenever you looked at Australia, you saw a ton of really, really cool literature and research coming out of there because they've been doing these things, uh, you know, as it relates to both performance and repair and recovery for a long, long time. And so uh, I always sort of been on the periphery of mine, um, you know, even as a, as a researcher. But uh, I didn't have any experience until the pharmacy started up. Um, but uh, it was a quick learning experience because uh, I, I knew sort of the, the industry and I got to try a lot of these things myself. Awesome. Well, and let's kind of talk about that a little bit, just being exposed to them, because right now there are a lot of websites online that are producing these for research purposes only. And you know, I'm a little sketched out by those people buying them from China. There's a reason that we have these regulations and, you know, I feel like you guys are kind of doing it the right way. Also having a doctor or some type of someone leading you through and keeping these safe. I mean, so what kind of things have you seen as far as, and you can kind of talk about how the regulations work with peptides. Cause again, these are, are new things or not really new, yeah, but yeah, them being popular now. You know, exactly. And, and I always sort of like to talk about it. Less than, currently right now, less than 8% of drugs are uh, peptides or, or proteins in the FDA. They anticipate that growing substantially. Can, in the next can you talk years. real quick difference in peptides and, you know, hormones or, you know, why people are like, oh, well, what's the difference? Is it not a, just a drug or? Yeah, definitely. And, and it is entirely and should entirely be viewed as a drug. Um, you know, there's certain drugs out there which are peptides, right? Even actually one of the, the first hormones ever discovered uh, was an intestinal hormone. Um, that, uh, that regulated, uh, you know, feeding behavior and digestion. So peptides can be hormones. The, the, um, the really the difference between the two uh, just goes to the actual chemical structure. Um, you know, peptides are sort of defined as, you know, amino acid sequences less than 50 amino acids. And, you know, it sort of goes back to basic, you know, biochemistry. How does the, uh, how does the body enact genetic, uh, how does it sort of take genetic material and make it into, um, you know, processes, and it happens through transcription of peptides and proteins. Um, and so we're, we're, the peptides and proteins are a really good tool to uh, have more precise effects. Whenever we're mm -hmm. talking about extracellular signaling, uh, the peptides are able to specifically target and bind to certain cellular receptors for a specific result. In addition to that, they have generally a, a short half-life, so you get really one precise signal, and then it's gone. And that can be used to manipulate... Uh, to manipulate certain things, uh, unlike hormones, which oftentimes have a little bit bigger and more broad uh, type of appeal. Awesome. So, and then, so shorter half life, I would assume, equals a little more safe. I know some drugs have, you know, a two week half life. You took it, too bad. It takes forever to get out of your system, and you're going to continue to experience their effects. With half life, where with peptides, not so much. You know, no, that, that, again, that's, uh, that, that's accurate, completely accurate. You know, uh, side effects are, are very, very low with the peptides. Beyond that, you know, uh, you have very, very few drug-to-drug -drug interactions because most peptides are actually degraded in the blood um, and not in the livers or kidneys. So um, as a result, you know, you don't have to worry about stacking medication. You can use multiple peptides at the same time without mm -hmm. worrying about side effects. 
Um, the safety profile is generally pretty good, but along with that comes all the disadvantages of peptides. Mainly the one that most everyone's familiar with is that you have to take it frequently and then you have to dose it via uh, subcutaneous injection because you know oral and nasal uh, dosage forms don't work as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what delivery methods? Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Can I do some of these sublinguals? And maybe maybe we'll talk about those individually, but most of the time these are injected or? Yeah, definitely. Most of them are injected. There's a, a good amount of research in, in some, particularly if it's there are certain types of things which absorb better, you know, nasally or sublingual. Um, generally, the number one restraint is size. Um, and whenever you get above a certain number of amino acids, you know, traditionally it's around five or six. Uh, and the other thing that matters is, is how hydrophobic or hydrophilic it is, right? You know, is it, is it going to easily permeate that membrane? Is it going to be stable while it's trying to do that? Um, all of those things are pretty big considerations, but size tends to be the, the main discussion. And the number one consideration typically is that uh, if you're going to try and do it in those dose forms, you also have to dose it at a higher concentration. Mm-hmm. which brings in the next consideration, which is cost. Yep. Okay. Well, what about safety? Why can't I just buy these? You know, everyone's kind of getting around it by going online. As a doctor, like I definitely, I do not recommend that. I've had a lot of people ask me, hey, doc, I'll just buy this online. I'll buy this in China. I'll buy this in Mexico. You know, why not buy it online? Yeah, no, and, uh, and the, the number one reason not to buy it online is just regulation. Uh, you know, with anything that you want to ingest, you want to know, I think, that it's going to be yeah, safe. Um, right. And there are certain rules and regulations to make that happen in the pharmaceutical community, making sure that people use FDA suppliers, that the FDA comes and, and takes a look at these facilities. With the online stuff, it's, it's honestly just a claim with really no one making sure that it's real or that it's, it's not. Uh, really, we don't know anything about its origin. We don't know who it's coming from. A lot of the time, even though it's selling from a company, you don't even know where that company is based or how to reach them or anything of, anything of that nature. Um, and so as a result, you know, uh, yeah, I always point to the, the article I was talking to you about uh, sort of uh, before, and that is a New York Times article called The Vast Part of a Doping Conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it sort of it has a statement in there that says that 80% of these products um, or fraudulent if you buy them online. But beyond that, I mean, it's, you know, there are also some, some legal, uh, you know, I guess cases where, uh, you know, selling of these things is pretty prohibited. So we definitely don't recommend for the same thing. You know, even if you do get the product, there are a lot of things that can go wrong with it, um, you know, in terms of are you getting the right potency? Are you getting any aggregation? You know, are you getting the wrong salt? Are you going to be building an antibody response to it, which makes, you know, uh, it less likely to work in the future? There are a lot of things there that, you uh, that can affect the clinical side of things. Um, and it's really not worth it, uh, considering that, you know, even from third party sources like the New York Times, we, we know that 80% isn't real. Yeah. And I, we, this is a big problem with the, the supplement industry as well. I love supplements. Um, I personally only use websites. There's ones like Fullscript, Natural Partners, uh, Emerson, that they all have their supplements third party tested. Uh, because I see a lot of ED and I have guys come in and they're taking, uh, they're taking gas station supplements. And from what I understand, you don't know what's in those things. They may say that it's maca or ginseng, but I've heard as far as methamphetamine salts being put in those things. So guys come in they're like, yeah, it worked. And I'm like, you were on meth for a little bit. Okay. So, you know, really safety is a, a big concern. So I like anyone kind of listening, I really want to drive that home. Um, especially being with a professional like Ryan and talking about these things, it's important to Make sure you're getting good stuff and seeing a doctor for these things. Um, you know, talking about ED, we can talk a little bit about PT-141. Uh, I've been, I just started using this. I can't talk a whole lot about it on my patients yet because I don't have a lot of experience. But Ryan, can you, can you jump in with, uh, with PT-141? Yeah, definitely. The, 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 the bremelanotide PT-141 is a really, really interesting product. And it's actually, uh, it's been submitted as a, a, a FDA approved product. So we should be hearing sometime early summer All right. uh, about its uh, status as an FDA approved drug. It'll be, it'll be used to uh, treat female sexual dysfunction or hyposexual arousal disorder. Um, and it, so that's exciting. There's going to be a new tool for women, which is, you know, generally something that they don't have. Uh, but beyond that, we use a ton in men just because uh, it's 80% uh, successful in treating uh, ED for those people who don't respond to PD5 inhibitors like Cialis or, uh, or, or Viagra. And so uh, we have really, really good results with it. Um, and it gives us a new tool. It, it works a little bit differently than things that just increase blood flow. It works on the central nervous system. Um, so it also increases libido and arousal, which, again, is uh, pretty novel and new. 
Yeah, I love that because right now at the clinic I am at, we do uh, some of the trimix injections, which is uh, an injection into the penis using a prostaglandin. So for these guys to be able to move the injection from their penis into their stomach is a, is a huge benefit. We have some guys really excited about trying that out. So um, I'll keep everyone posted about you know what, what our experience is. Um, but I, I really, I really got in the. Pe- oh, yeah. Uh, you, you got you something else on the PT? Yeah, well, no, I was just going to say the other thing is the safety profile there, too. Is, yeah. Uh, it's a lot easier uh, and a lot less to worry about. So it might have some side effects like nausea. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, it probably has a little bit more side effects than most peptides, uh, but it's definitely still worth it as a second-line therapy before trimix or bimix. Okay. And that one, they were using that internasally and there's some blood pressure issues or what kind of happened? There. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Is that uh, they were using it nasally, and that's sort of how it actually got uh, sort of disappeared for a couple of years on the FDA radar is because uh, they had hypertension side effects. And um, as a result, they, they didn't know that they could get FDA approval. Uh, but whenever they switched to the subcutaneous injection, they uh, noticed they didn't get the same hypertension side effects. So um, that's when they proceeded to resubmit it and get, uh, go further down the line with phase two and phase three clinical trials. Awesome. I'm, I'm kind of curious, um, talking about ED and men, and uh, I haven't done a whole lot with the SARMs either. That's kind of where I'm going. And, and again, if I mess up some of these peptides, I'm new to them, so correct me um, on their mechanisms of actions. Uh, but yeah. looking at MK677 and LGD, can you talk about those a little bit? Those are, are those SARMs? Am I correct with that and kind of what they do? Well, yeah, the, the LGD is, is definitely a SARM. And the, the important distinction is actually those are not, both of those uh, chemically are, are would not be considered peptides. They're often lumped okay. in the same category just because uh, of their, I should say, demand from a, from a performance standpoint. Okay. The LGD is, is definitely working on androgen receptors and stimulating androgen receptors. Um, and there's a really good study, you know, out, out of uh, uh, Boston that talks about the LGD and sort of how it works on body composition in men and some of its side effects. It is, uh, again, working on those same testosterone receptors, so those same DHT receptors, but it's not converting to DHT and it's not converting to, okay. to, uh, to, to estrogen. And so as a result, you don't have to worry about, you know, things like hair loss, uh, benign prostate hyperplasia. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, gynecomastia in men. Um, and so it is, uh, it's been a successful, I guess, addition, but it's probably not there in terms of replacing testosterone therapy. I would say traditionally the people who are using it are using it as a supplementation uh, for anabolic benefit for those people who have, you know, pretty bad sarcopenia. Um, for women who are afraid to go on testosterone because of hair loss or virulization, um, or they're just uh, do trying to help younger people um, achieve some, some uh, clinical results whenever they're probably a little too young to decrease their natural production. Can you mix these with testosterone? Like part of the reasoning I thought is like, I have some guys on testosterone and when you see guys get to super physiological levels or just a little bit out of the reference range from what I see, free testosterone is above 20, total testosterone above a thousand. You can get some thickness in the red blood cells. You have more, like you're saying, converging into, conversion to estrogen. So my thinking was, okay, if I can increase the sensitivity of those testosterone receptors, then maybe I'm able to lower their dose. Is that... Definitely. And some people will, will, will definitely try that. The, the issue just goes to its lipid effects. And sometimes you have mm. an increase in LDL cholesterol and a decrease in HDL. And obviously, uh, some people, you know, now are more worried about oxidized LDL. Um, and so we don't have that data yet um, in terms of what its, what its effect on the lipid profile is. But um, because of that effect, we actually recommend short courses. Um, so usually, you know, uh, we, we recommend either three weeks like the Boston trial um, and, uh, or, or four weeks going a little bit above that and then taking a break and, and sort of helping use that break time to normalize. Okay. And, and, and on the other end of that, you have the MK677. This one got really popular. I feel like, I think Joe Kim Noah got in trouble for taking this one. I, or there's a couple of athletes. Um, sure. what's yeah. the difference between that and the LGD? Yeah, so the, the, um, the LGD is, is a SARM. The MK677 is actually working on growth hormone secretion. Oh, okay. So it's mimicking... Yeah, it's mimicking uh, ghrelin, or, or it's working on the growth hormone secreted got one alpha receptor uh, or one A receptor, um, and it's stimulating uh, pretty high levels of growth hormone release, much like a lot of the other growth hormone peptides. Um, the, the issue with that one, though, is it's orally bioavailable, and the IGF-1 rise is pretty predictable. On average, it tends to be around a 50% increase in IGF-1, wow. um, and uh, and as a result, it's, it's pretty good. I, the reason that we I would say it's not as popular as other forms are because um, over the course of, of time, you actually don't see much of a fat loss benefit. You actually see an increase in lean muscle mass, 
but adipose tissues tend to stay the same. Mm. And most people who are looking for growth hormone optimization tend to want, uh, you know, increasingly muscle mass and decreased fat mass. So some of the other growth hormone options are probably used a little bit more frequently, uh, but this one has the advantage of being oral, which again, the others do not. Okay. That makes sense. So, and the old school and, and everything's kind of moving forward. Like the, the Samoralin was the real popular one. And now we have Amplamorlin and CJ1295. Um, Is that right? Right. Um, yeah, with, with those, uh, what do we see? And what's, is there, there's some type of difference between One's a one's a pep one is a peptide releasing hormone or the ones are analog one's a hormone releasing is there there's a difference between these? Yeah, yeah. Technically, it all comes down to the receptor which they're hitting on the pituitary to stimulate growth hormone release. Okay. Um, and there are two 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 of those receptors. Um, you know, one is accepting uh, usually natural signal from your hypothalamus, so your brain is telling it when to secrete growth hormone. The other one is. Re- receiving uh, input from ghrelin or, you know, the, as some people call it the hunger hormone. Mm-hmm. Um, and together, those have an interplay to, uh, to both release uh, growth hormone and reduce the blocking and the inhibition of release of, of growth hormone. Um, and so together, you get, um, you get sort of a synergistic effect of growth hormone release. That's why almost uh, we all, everyone will recommend them at the same mm-hmm. time. They're definitely synergistic. And you want to be hitting both of those receptors uh, to get the maximum uh, clinical benefit. Okay, and that was specifically amplamorlin and CJ1295. Correct, yeah. And it's the, the, the types of, I guess, products generally that most people will so associate with growth hormone releasing hormone or are going to be uh, the samorlin, the CJC, and the tessamorlin. Those okay. tend to be the three most commonly on that receptor, whereas uh, the other class is going to be involving the GHRP2, the GHRP6, the hexarelin, um, and then the, the ipamorlin and MK677. So it has a, a few more receptors on, or I should say a, four, a few more uh, different drug options on that. Um, but, uh, but those are the, sort of the two classes. Okay. And what are you seeing as far as popularity? And then are there any side effects with them? I've heard some stuff about prolactin and cortisol with some of the growth hormone releasing uh, peptides. Definitely. Yeah. I like to, the, the growth hormone releasing uh, peptides uh, two and six uh, were not, you know, were actually discovered even before they discovered what the natural ligand was. Before they even knew what ghrelin was stimulating, they knew that they had already uh, sort of found that GHRP6 was working. So the GHRP6 was first generation has the most side effects. Uh, the one that is probably the most uh, most talked about is its effect on hunger, with a, a, a great increase in, in in hunger, almost voracious eating. GHRP2 is a little bit more corrected, but the ipamorlin is one we use by far the most common from that category because it's so selective uh, against side effects. It doesn't raise hunger, it doesn't raise prolactin, it doesn't raise cortisol, it doesn't raise acetylcholine levels. Um, also, it, 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 it's even got a, a clinical, tra- or I should say, a, a paper. Um, that labels it as the first selective growth hormone uh, secretagogue. Um, and so we're, we're really high on that one and use that with, uh, I'd say, a high regularity. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna start, we're just starting to play with that as well at the clinic. And so why do people use these, the growth hormone analogs? Are you talking about performance? Do they help with anything in particular as far as joint health? Uh, yeah, definitely. Hair, and hair growth, growth, I've heard. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I, I would say, you know, uh, it generally has all the benefits of growth hormone, which I would say traditionally tend to be, you know, better body comp, uh, better metabolic profile, lipid profile. So, you know, things like reducing your carotid intima media thickness, mm. uh, reducing your triglycerides, um, you know, improving your insulin sensitivity. And that one can be a little bit tricky sometimes. Um, but the other things are, you know, better energy, better sleep. Um, and you know, just the, all of the things that sort of were popularized with growth hormone, you get with the growth hormone secretagogues, but sort of in a safer way, a less expensive way. Um, and you get uh, additionally some other types of protection. So it, it is sort of a win-win from the transition from exogenous growth hormone to sort of getting your body's natural functioning back to, to where is optimal. Yeah. And so for who people don't know too, this is actual growth hormone you are unable to give to patients unless they are on, they like, they have a um, dwarfism or some form of uh, actual low growth hormone. And with growth hormone too, there are actual side effects. So this is kind of a great way to get around that. And why I was curious too, if you could mix these growth hormone analogs, like you were talking about earlier with other peptides, um, like a popular one right now is also the BPC um, 157. Is that I got to make sure I get all these numbers right. Okay. And that's body protecting. Okay. Body protecting compound. So people are are using that. They sub, they sub Q inject that around an area, like a a joint problem. 
or muscle yeah, problems? Or what's actually, that about? Yeah, it was actually a good transition there too, because we also know that using um, the the BPC actually upregulates growth hormone receptors on ligaments. Oh, um, cool. and so, so even using them together shows us some type of synergistic effect as well. Um, and so, yeah, the the, the BPC is uh, is a very, very complex product with a bunch of research in a bunch of different fields. Um, it has three clinical trials that have sort of been, uh, uh, that have been, I guess, undergoing in humans, but all, none of them have been released to the public. So it doesn't have as much data as a lot of these other products, but it's quickly going in use just because uh, people tend to get really good results for both repair and recovery and then also some type of GI uh, problems such as oh, yeah. ulcer fun. And that's how they that's how they first started using the BPC. I heard was in in rats for gastrointestinal stuff. Yeah, it's actually so the BPC is part of a larger molecule, uh, a larger protein, which actually isolated from gastric juice. Oh. Um, and so it's uh, you know it's it, it, we have good good results in terms of even upper GI things like uh, you know ulcers in the stomach or gastric reflux. But uh, yeah, it's based on the uh, a, a sequence and, and a natural product. Mm, awesome, which is great because we just see so many people with, with gut issues, but then you can do that orally. Are, do, are we making it that way yet? Or Yeah, correct. And, and it's one of the very, very few peptides which is available orally and, and able to resist some of the digestion from the, from the, uh, the relatively rough pH environment of the stomach. So uh, one of the very, very few peptides which is orally bioavailable. Awesome. And for a lot of people that you just started listening to the podcast, naturopathic medicine, we take a huge um, view as fixing almost everything with the body is what's going on with your gut. If you're unable to, you know, absorb food, um, the gut brain axis, you know, your, your, your gut produces more neurotransmitters than your brain, which is also a good transition into some of these nootropics. But I also felt like I read on uh, Solanct and some Max, was one of them antimicrobial for the gut or am I thinking of a different peptide? Well, yeah, yeah. So we, we do have a couple antimicrobial peptides in the gut. The C-Link um, is actually made from a viral component of, of Tupsin. So it, it really helps uh, with sort of its antiviral capabilities. Oh, cool. uh, the other thing I should note and really direct the podcast listeners to is there's a really good study on BPC in the gut-brain axis. All uh, right. Exactly like you talked about, that exact same, uh, that exact same mechanism of, of neurotransmitters and serotonin modulation. Uh, it's a really, really interesting study, which which might be worth taking a look at. Uh, but yeah, the, the C-Link and the C-Max are both great nootropics as well. They're you know sort of a, got a, a lot of research from Russia. Have been used um, you know over there. They've been approved products, um, and the, the C-Link definitely has an antiviral ability uh, with reducing even you know uh, influenza or herpes uh, virus titers. Wow. Well. Awesome. And then, but uh, two some nootropic effects from them. You know, brain cognition. Yeah, absolutely. The the C link is uh, is generally viewed as a more uh, anti anxiety type of mm -hmm. product, whereas the C max is viewed as more of a uh, a functioning product. So more of a if you're going to go study or you're going to try and treat you know ADHD, they have studies with the C max, whereas the C link is more of um, like I said, more of a anti anxiety type product. Uh, still good for mental functioning, but probably not as often used for performance and mental mental performance as the C max. Well, that makes sense, especially when you're you're dealing with the gut brain axis. If you're able to affect the microbiome, uh, we do see that anxiety, depression uh, in people. So, if there's some way you're affecting that, that would have nootropic effects. You know, half the time people have uh, cognitive, uh, they're cognitively impaired. A lot of times, it has to do with their gut. So that's that's really cool. Um, I don't know how much I want to overload people, but we can keep going about epitalin. Is is you guys are messing with epitalin? That's one of the big ones for telomere length. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They're, they're, the epitalin is another Russian peptide, you know, and so it goes, sort of goes to speak about the uh, sort of the amount that's been happening, you know, all over the world in peptide development. Um, and sort of the U.S. is just now sort of catching that wave. But uh, yeah, the epitalin has been studied by Dr. Cavinson from Russia, um, and it has some good data. And it, the one data that looks at uh, uh, telomeres, it has been studied in um, lung fibroblasts and actually elongated the telomeres by 33% in that study. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, again, we don't have any human data there. It's only in vitro. But um, we, we do know we, through, through some really, really good human data that it has a lot of other benefits as well, such as, uh, you know, normalizing the circadian rhythm, you know, helping with cortisol and melatonin levels and reducing, uh, you know, 15-year morbidity and mortality. Wow. And, and I, one of the controversies with this guy is he's the, the, the Russian doctor. He's one of the only ones that's kind of studied it. So they're still waiting to, 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 to mimic the studies. Is, is that right? 
Yes, or is there more? That's absolutely correct. Uh, okay. And uh, actually, I learned this weekend uh, that maybe the, maybe someone in Ukraine had actually validated his study. So oh, I, cool. I, I'm definitely looking at that right now, trying to get that information. Uh, but yeah, it, it is a little bit, uh, I would say, a little, there are certain, certain vocal skeptics out there, uh, particularly, you know, with the study. Yeah, Dr. Bill Andrews uh, is one of those who, who uh, you know, doesn't quite, I, I guess, believe the telomere study. So again, we'd like to make all the information possible to all of our physicians and, uh, and uh, we, we, we would happily provide that. Well, and can you talk a little bit about telomeres? Like what are telomeres? Why is that important that it's increasing their length? Yeah, so some people, you know, uh, as, as you get older you, and your DNA, uh, I guess, continues to replicate, it continues to get shorter. So the telomeres are, are you know, the, those repeat, repeated sequence at the end of your DNA um, that uh, sort of drop off with age. And one of the things with cellular senescence, or whenever a cell dies, is uh, it can start getting into the DNA that's actually useful um, and cause things like, you know, cancer or even just cell death, um, which, is, which is equally as bad. So some people really equate it to aging. You know, there, there's definitely some scatter plots with telomere length as it relates to age and uh, some, some really interesting data in that. But a lot of people view it as another way to uh, increase longevity. Mm. And also the epitalon, though, is, is in the nootropic class. People are using it. They're noticing these uh, cognitive effects or... Yeah, some some people definitely are, and I think it tends to relate to that circadian rhythm. Again, it's working directly in the brain on the pineal gland, um, where you know your circadian rhythm is 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 uh, sort of developed. Uh, and you know, I can tell you that from an anecdotal standpoint, we don't get a lot of the nootropic effects, uh, but we definitely do get uh, you know help with sleep, which uh, mm-hmm. it definitely it lends its uh, lends its help to uh, optimal mental functioning. Awesome. Is there any other peptides uh, coming out that you guys are, you know, looking at right now or? Yeah, several, several. We're, we're really excited about a, a class of uh, molecules which help deliver peptides transdermally. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if we can get over the, the subcutaneous injection route, it'll make it a lot cheaper and a lot more widely available uh, for people. So that's something of interest to us. And we're always looking at, uh, at, at new things, um, particularly right now, the biggest areas of development in the research around peptides tend to be in uh, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, uh, and, and and cancer. And so we're hoping that uh, you know, as as more money is developed uh, for research into those areas, we'll develop a lot more peptides we can use. Yeah. What do you see as far as kind of the future? Do you peptides? There aren't, to my understanding, there aren't a whole lot of compounding pharmacies that are doing this. Do you know? Is there reasons why or? Yeah, the, the number one reason just happens to be supply. Um, and so more and more people are going to get into it. You've already seen that uh, be the case uh, in the industry. And so, and again, it sort, of, it sort of mimics the natural growth that peptides are having in the, from a big pharma and insurance-based world as well. Uh, these things are going to become way more popular and much more readily available because uh, of the uh, sort of the overwhelming data. And once the science gets better on how to extend the half-lives of these things, how to make them uh, once weekly injections instead of once you know daily, uh, it'll become uh, a lot more feasible for to sell the commercial product. That's awesome. And so what's your guys' direction with the company? Just keep popping out new, uh, new peptides because you guys are currently in Kentucky? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, yeah, and we, we again, uh, we, we always thoroughly vet and evaluate a product before we're able to offer it. So, but we, we are always uh, you know, looking toward, toward the future and what can be the best solution both for the doctors and patients. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, we hope to be able to offer uh, some innovative but, uh, but definitely safe and, and well thought out products uh, for a long time to come. Awesome. And, uh, and we don't have to get too much into this. And hey, I can always edit things later if you're uncomfortable. Just talking a little bit about FDA and regulations and how that's affecting you guys. Here in California, we, we're being hit by a lot of things. and A lot of compounding pharmacies are leaving. Um, what hoops do you guys have to jump through to get regulated in different states? Do you see anything kind of in the future there that's affecting you guys or... Yeah, yeah, definitely. So compounding pharmacies have had, uh, since the New England compounding incident where several patients were uh, unfortunately died as a result of uh, a meningitis infection, a fungal meningitis infection, the compounding pharmacies all over the country have been looked at with magnifying glass, and rightfully so. Uh, you know, whenever something happens like that, you definitely want uh, legislation to protect uh, both patients and physicians. And so, um, you, you know, the, the FDA has sort of started to, to take a, a larger interest in compounding pharmacies in regulating it on a federal level where it previously most compounding pharmacies were regulated on a state-by-state basis. Um, and currently that transition is sort of midway. Uh, you know, the FDA definitely inspects most compounding pharmacies, uh, but you also have to get licensed on a state-by-state basis. 
Um, one of, you know, again, as you mentioned, California is a particularly difficult state because anything that's done as a sterile injectable there um, has to go through stability studies, which cost, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars um, and take, you know, several months. So the, for each product, you have a particularly high threshold of, of barrier of entry. Um, and then beyond that, it uh, can just be a very, very expensive process. So for a lot of these compounders, it becomes, you know, not worth it financially. Um, and, uh, and from an FDA federal perspective, uh, they are trying to create what they call a bulk drug compounding list, which mm-hmm. it really establishes a list of uh, ingredients that they would want pharmacies to work with. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Fun stuff. Um, you know, hoops and stuff we have to jump through. Um, Ryan, anything that I didn't kind of cover that with the, with the peptides that you thought, you know, people should really know any, uh, you know, side effects and exciting new things. Yeah, no, no, no. I think, uh, I think that you, you definitely covered the most of it. I think, uh, again, just to sort of reiterate the point from the beginning, I think supplies is definitely an important thing. Um, and, uh, and for people to be educated, I think, uh, there, there are definitely some things that can make, uh, prescribing these things difficult. And you always want to go with a, a very well trained physician that's supplying from a reliable source. Awesome. And then how do people find you, Ryan? Yeah, so they can always go on our website, tailormadecompounding.com. Uh, and if they have any questions or want a physician in their area, we'd be happy to direct them to the right place. Awesome. I've been working with Ryan. Can't recommend him enough. Uh, and what I'll do, we'll throw this up on YouTube and I'll put your information on there. So, uh, you know, I know a lot of my colleagues are getting more and more interested in, in the peptides. So they can reach out to you and, and get some stuff rolling because I want to get this stuff out here. Uh, from an anti-aging perspective, I think we live in one of the best times ever. Uh, right now, most of my, my practices have been TRT. Oh, one thing I didn't really talk about either. Do you know as far as other regenerative therapies talking about, for instance, with the BPC using like prolotherapy, PRP, are you pretty familiar with those stem cells? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We, we actually have a, a hair protocol out now that's in an institutional review board study on how to maximize uh, PRP in addition to some other products, particularly for us with Simon's and Beta 4. Um, and so, yeah, we, we frequently work with a variety of, of combination therapies, whether it be PRP or prolotherapy or uh, whatever it might be. And, and um, traditionally, uh, most of these products are definitely additive to that. Okay. We, when we didn't even talk about thymus and beta four, there's so many great things to yeah. talk about. A lot of people are using that with PRP or what's in, I, I heard there was some controversy with that. It was on the market. It's hard to get now. It's more expensive or what's going on there. Yeah, sure. So the thymus and beta four, again, is one of those that's uh, thoroughly progressing clinical trials. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's been, uh, unfortunately, it's one of those which is heavily associated with, with doping. Um, uh, just because, uh, you know, even in Australia, there was a, a relatively large sports scandal on it, but it's been used uh, and, and banned in water associated sports for a long, long time due to its repair and recovery effects uh, via, you know, actin uh, sequestering uh, ability and the ability for angiogenesis. So it really reduces the recovery time, uh, it reduces delayed onset muscle soreness, and, and uh, it helps with recovery, both after, you know, it's been studied post myocardial infarction. Uh, and you know, and, and things of that nature. So it's got a lot of reparative effects, um, but uh, people are using it with PRP for those exact same reasons. Um, sort of helping with angiogenesis, helping with uh, you know increasing growth factors, increasing differentiation of stem cells. Um, it, it's really a good product to mix in there to to help in the same way that the PRP is helping. Mm. And then, so are these, are some of these lists on banned substances or all of them banned or what can people, you know, a lot of people I just see are, are weekend warriors, but you know, good to know dealing with athletes or, you know, CrossFit or sports or what things yeah. do those guys have to look out for? Definitely. Unfortunately, uh, most of anyone who is tested competitively, uh, should definitely work out. I should say be, be concerned about these testing, you know, the Simon's and Beta 4, the BPC, um, you know, all of those things are, are either banned by the peptide themselves or banned by class. Um, and so, you know, you would definitely want to consult with any regulatory organization before you use it because uh, those regulatory organizations definitely stay on the ball and are on the cutting edge of, of uh, saying what is or is not allowed. Okay. I'll have to just check into that then. And uh, are they, anyone using these peptides IV form? Any benefit to that or... Yeah, definitely. Some of them have traditionally been studied IV. Um, so a lot of people are doing them IV. You know, to, I would say most of the time, with uh, very few exceptions, uh, you don't necessarily need to do them IV. Subcutaneous dosing is, is probably equally effective. Uh, but with that being said, uh, whenever you're doing things like an immunity IV, uh, things like the thymus and alpha-1 are, are added to that to, to make uh, it, it sort of increase your immune system in a, in a way that's more efficacious than just 
such as high vitamin C by itself. Awesome. Jesus, man, so much great information. I don't know what the heck we're going to do with this. I'd like to, I'll probably end up cutting a lot of these up in clips and putting them online so people can kind of, you know, shift through these things slowly because I'm brain burnt and, and I already kind of knew a lot about it, these things. So, sure. um, Brian, yeah. you did a great job explaining all these things. Again, I can't recommend you enough. Um, from here, what I'll do is we'll, we'll, I'll throw some of the information that you have and, and a YouTube link, throw this baby up. And, uh, um, again, Ryan, I can't thank you enough for joining me here. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Moore. I appreciate your time and uh, look forward to working together. All right. See you later, man. All right. Thanks. Bye. -bye.